everyone. Thank you for joining us today for another great iteration of our educational series. My name is Alex Perney. We'll be getting started here in just one second. All right, looks like everything is fired up and ready. So let's go ahead and get started. Today, we're gonna to be kind of focusing on the other side of the coin as opposed to maybe saying, hey, here's how to invest your IRA uh, with a little bit more of a, of a flair and flavor towards if you are an investor kind of approaching other people with regard to utilizing IRAs and the benefit that that can offer and how those things can be structured into your deals. Because there's a bunch of different ways that you can essentially do this. It's not just simply saying, hey, can I borrow money from someone's particular IRA? There's you know a few different ways to do it. Although borrowing money from someone's IRA is a great way to do that because it allows you to be extremely flexible with kind of how you're offering uh, them to invest in your particular project or deal and giving you a great de degree of leeway of also how to structure those terms as well. My name is Alex Perney. I've been with Advantha since 2012. If you have any questions following this presentation, feel free to reach out to me directly. I've had a lot of experience in actually helping people structure these specific types of investments within their IRA accounts. So if you do have any questions regarding this or really kind of any other type of <clears throat> investment strategy or just how IRAs work in general, feel free to reach out to me. I'm more than happy to answer those. Or if you have a question during the presentation, also feel free to chime in as well. A little bit about Advanta IRA. We have almost 20 years of industry experience as a self-directed IRA uh, administrator with a staff of <clears throat> certified IRA services professionals that are here and ready to help you out with getting any of these types of investments done. Uh, any and all cash that anyone holds here is going to be FDIC insured, so you're not giving up any type of uh, traditional protections if your investors want to use self-direction. It's not anything that's going to be so exotic that they're giving up any type of protection. It's just a matter of understanding that this is a different way of doing things and having a specific custodian that's a willing and able to do these types of investments with your deals is very important. Uh, we've uh, been doing this again for a long time with a lot of different clients. We have almost 9,000 active individual clients and a little bit over $2 billion in assets under administration here. So uh, we have a lot of experience. And then also anyone that's looking to do self-direction or invest in one of your deals has dedicated client management here. So you're not calling into a general call center if you need help whether it's putting together your deal or if the person that is holding the account needs help with any type of administration or actually performing the asset or the investment, we're also here to help with that dedicated client management. So what is a self-directed account? Most people kind of get a little bit confused on the initial uh, startup of these things is that if you have someone that's looking to invest, uh, you know, let's say in your deal, whatever that happens to be, you need some type of retirement plan administrator that can actually help with that. Now, different large uh, wirehouses and places like that will specifically um, have different types of uh, things that I like to call self-direction, but they aren't inherently going to be self-directed. So you need someone that's going to specialize in actually holding these types of alternative investments, whether that's interest in your LLC or trust, whether that's lending uh, to your LLC, whether that's lending to you as an individual or holding that type of funding for that project that is actually going on. Uh, I see someone chimed in. Uh, yes, you are muted, um, but uh, the audio uh, does appear to be working on my end. Everything is unmuted. So um, not as I'm sure what is on your end, but but um, everything should be, uh, at least as far as what it's showing me on the webinar, as piping audio through just fine. If anyone else is having an issue, please let me know. Um, <clears throat> now, self-directed accounts can be used for many different types of alternative investments. So depending on exactly how you are structuring something, it isn't necessarily going to preclude you from doing something. It's just a matter of understanding that if you're putting together a deal, talking to the custodian, or in this case, Advanta, to try to figure out exactly how this is going to be put together is very important. I've worked with uh, many different investment providers, whether it's uh, syndicators looking to raise money from IRAs or individuals that are just looking for money for a rehab project. Uh, everything, you know, big to small can be utilized with this and just understanding that the great tax benefit that you get from utilizing IRAs can be a very big uh, benefit to your investors if you're going to be taking in uh, monies from these types of accounts. <clears throat> now, these types of investments are going to be outside of the stock market. Therefore, you get to really kind of avoid that big roller coaster effect that a lot of people see. So, uh, yes, uh, essentially, the, the gentleman that's asking, um, uh, I, I haven't muted your audio. Um, your, uh, your ability to speak into the presentation is muted, but everyone else, uh, if anyone can also just confirm that they can hear the audio, that'd be great because. Um, except for this one person, I, I do see that everything's going out. Anyone uh, care just to quickly say if they can hear me or not? 
Uh, if anyone in the chat could just confirm that the audio is coming through on your end. Okay, great. Thank you. I uh, see someone uh, did there. Yeah, unfortunately, sorry, the individual that said that they uh, can't hear anything. It looks like it might be an issue on your end, but uh, we'll keep rolling on. Hopefully, you can get that uh, that figured out. So, again, the nice thing about doing this, especially if you're approaching investors, is that you get to offer not only a fantastic tax benefit to taking in IRA money, but also you get to invest these funds in a manner that's outside of the stock market. Now, we just had new CPI data put out today, so, of course, that's going to affect uh, you know, things such as stock prices, uh, you know, it's really kind of hard to time uh, with any type of um, certainty how you can make money within a stock market. Now, granted, you know, over a long enough period of time, you can probably expect to see, you know, 8% or so on your money. But uh, as we all know, at least if you're tuned in here, that you can certainly see much better returns in a much more tangible asset class, like things such as real estate or those investments associated with it. So that is kind of what a self-directed IRA is and why these things are of benefit to you and your investors. Now, why do people choose self-direct? Now, a big part of at least of what we're doing here is that this is a new source of capital for you. So if you are, let's say, a real estate investor and you need money for a particular deal that you're doing, understanding that people's wealth is primarily tied up, at least for a large part, within retirement plans. There's almost $27 trillion in retirement plan assets in the United States. That's a lot of commas and a lot of zeros. And understanding how you can access that to fund your deals is going to be a great benefit to you. So again, why would you choose to do this is that it's a new source of capital. People's IRAs and retirement plans typically are going to be stuck within stock market type of an account, but it's not necessarily that they're restricted to doing that. It's just understanding and how to communicate that to people of, uh, you know, why this might be a benefit. And one thing that can definitely be a benefit to you is trying to really play on the fatigue of the stock market. <clears throat> you know, especially this year, we have the tech sector being down almost 24% across the board uh, with almost no end in sight as to when the bleeding is going to stop, at least with that particular market, and really kind of no certain direction on when anything's going to actually kind of turn a corner. But we've all, you know, really seen just how well real estate has done and other types of investments, at least that we see a lot of here. So uh, real estate related investments, private investments into things like syndication, or at least a lot of things centered around real estate can really be a big benefit to you if you're trying to raise capital uh, and use other people's money for your particular investment. So that's how I typically tell people to try to approach their investors is really kind of saying, hey, you know, if you're tired of the stock market, we really have another way that you can utilize this other amount of capital that you have, especially if these people are already investing in your deals uh, in order to be able to get outside of the scope of just, you know, regular security trading with you know, where probably a good chunk of their money is tied up. And of course, if they do have IRAs, the tax benefits to these types of plans is immeasurable. You have the ability to either defer any and all taxation within an IRA or completely exempt yourself from that type of taxation if you are in a Roth plan. So being able to kind of approach your investors with the ability to offer a avenue outside of the stock market and also still maintain those great tax benefits is very important. It's also important to understand when you're talking to people about trying to use their money. You know, you may approach someone that has invested with you in the past and conversations typically go something like this. It'll be like, hey, Jane, I have a new project coming up. It's a great 3-2, needs minimal work. Uh, we are probably going to flip it pretty quick or we're going to hold it for cash flow. Uh, you know, would you like to be involved in this? I need some money in order to be able to close. Well, Jane might come back and say, hey, you know what? I'm uh, you know, kind of tapped out with my personal capital right now. You know, maybe in a few months when I have a few deals close or, or pay off or have some more cash flow coming through, yes, I'd be definitely interested in investing. Now, by no additional expense to you and really kind of only adding additional benefit, just go back to that person and say, hey, you know, if you have an IRA or retirement plan, we can use that to invest in this deal and you're not going to have to pay any taxes or penalties to do so. It's going to be another great source of capital for you to be able to use and invest more into things that you know and understand. And automatically, just by kind of understanding that you can use other people's money, especially with regard to retirement plans, you've automatically added an additional uh, level of uh, benefit to what you're doing. You've added value to your relationship with that person. Cost yourself no additional expense by doing so. And again, 
are able to now access more money from the people in your network that you already have. So between uh, it being a new source of capital, getting to play on the fatigue of the stock market and being able to offer an additional tax benefit is really playing into why they might want to choose to self-direct and also why you might want to choose to actively try to inform your investors of you being able to utilize self-directed IRAs and retirement plans in general for funding your particular deals. Now, a lot of people kind of ask me, why isn't this more well known? Well, you know, it's it really kind of has to do with marketing and how people make money. Um, since 1975, you've been able to essentially use IRAs in this capacity, but banks, brokerage houses, wire clearing houses, you know, it's it's a lot easier to make money by doing stocks, bonds, and mutual funds and making it a little bit easier for people to just, you know, take their money, plug it into something that is a little bit more widely known, maybe not as widely understood, but widely known as the stock market. So you really need a really specialized custodian in order to handle the um, specific types of investments that we have here. So if you want to hold a mortgage or if you want to hold a piece of real estate within your IRA, somewhere like, again, a large brokerage house isn't going to have the specific staff and knowledge in order to be able to do things like that, be able to make sure taxes are paid, insurance is paid, make sure that income payments are correctly taken in and applied, whether it's principal and interest or whether it's a private stock repayment or some type of dividend, uh, you know, these larger places just aren't equipped to handle that. So the IRS allows for a very broad range of investments, but if you don't have a custodian that's understandably uh, in, in, entrenched in this kind of thing, you're not going to really be able to, uh, to do it. And again, just kind of the economy of scale and the marketing, big banks picked up on it and it kind of took a while for people to get traction and companies such as Advanta to really get traction in order to be able to offer these types of uh, service. Now, why are these a good source of capital for you? Well, you can easily solicit repeat investors. We see a lot of time where people come in and they will invest with a very small group of people over and over and over again with regard to their retirement plans. And again, these are typically larger chunks of money that you can use to invest in different projects. And the other good thing is that especially if you're investing in things like real estate, your the people that you are actually working with might have a proportionally smaller amount of money personally that they're willing to invest in your deals because let's face it you know when it comes to our personal finances we got to buy things like groceries uh, we got to put gas in our vehicles we have to you know basically just live life and you know the personal amount of finance that each and every one of us has we're not going to use the entirety of it to invest in a deal that might take 5 10 15 years to see some type of payout or only pay out on a quarterly basis um, you know, cash flow being great, but, you know, you have to be realistic with what you have on hand when it comes to personal finances. Now, the great thing about IRA funds that most people are not necessarily looking to use these things for at least five, 10 years, maybe even more. Uh, you know, I'm in my mid thirties. I really, you know, it wouldn't be a big deal for me at all if there was a good deal come along to be invested in some type of project that might take 15, 20 years to pay out because that money I have earmarked for my retirement. And since I'm so far away from actually retiring, it would make sense for me able to, to be a little bit more, um, a little bit more far far reaching when it comes to actually when I'm expecting a payout. So for you as the investor looking to make some type of value in the proposition to your investors, being able to say, hey, you know, you can use more of this money. We don't necessarily have to look at this as something that where you're going to need to be paid out immediately. And if you have more long term projects and maybe need more capital, utilizing retirement plans can be a very good benefit to you, especially since people just aren't necessarily looking to use the money immediately. And again, with market uncertainty, you get that kind of additional benefit of being able to play this to your investors of saying, hey, not only can this be a hedge against the uncertainty of the markets, but also something where you can be a little bit more uh, looking farther down the road as to when you're actually going to get paid back or how much cash flow is going to actually be, be returned. And again, tax benefits remaining equal. It is a very good tax. It is a very beneficial standpoint from a um, tax perspective. Now, there's a bunch of different types of assets that are out there and kind of we're going to spend a little bit of time on looking at this because depending on what you're actually investing in or what you're looking to try to raise capital for is not going to be dependent on being able to use an IRA or not. Now, the bulk of what we hold here at Advanta is going to be a more traditional real estate structure, things that people 
uh, acquire most often are going to be rental homes. You know, a three-two block house, uh, something that's really easy to rent out, uh, is going to be kind of the uh, bread and butter of what a lot of our clients traditionally have looked at. But that's certainly not to say that that is how you have to structure things. So if you're looking to raise money for a project, this could be a commercial real estate project, and we'll kind of get into what a syndication might look like in an IRA as well. Uh, if you're looking to maybe buy a home and flip it, you can certainly do single-family homes. Uh, you can do fixer-uppers, condos, duplexes, uh, any type of these things you can use IRA money for. And again, extending all those great tax benefits to that. And depending on what these projects are, some of these can be multi-year deals, deals, especially when it comes to multifamily property and syndications where you're looking at typically a five-year runoff. Now, granted, some of those types of projects might have you know, a quarterly distribution, but if people, again, have personal needs for personal finances, doing something where you have maybe a highly illiquid asset that is going to tie up a large chunk of their personal capital for several years might not be as attractive as coming to them when you say, hey, we can use your IRA funds. You don't have to pay any taxes on the returns that I'm going to give you. And then also you don't necessarily need to worry about this money because you already weren't planning on using it for many years. And now you get to utilize this with an asset class that you know and understand outside of the stock market. And again, being able to add that additional benefit without any additional expense to you is one of the cooler parts about this that I really find enticing for people. So remember that it does not matter what type of project you're putting together. It can be a standard three, two block rental home. It can be a it can be a mobile home park and it can be anything else in between and it doesn't have to be real estate related again when it comes to finding funding for projects most of the time people are going to be looking at this as real estate related but you could be putting together anything um, including startup companies if you're selling stock or llc interest in a startup company and again these kind of things can again be highly illiquid that have extremely high payouts which can really hammer people with taxes being able to understand that you can offer a great tax benefit if the startup company goes you know something very good and people are looking at maybe two three five or many multiples of their initial investment being able to allow them to not have to pay any taxes on that multiples of return dump it directly back into an ira while also using money that they're not necessarily needing for their day-to-day -day lives again, can definitely help you to access more capital from the people you already have. So again, this is kind of going back to saying, hey, you don't necessarily need to go out and get as many investors. You can get more funds from your initial investors or the people you already have in your network, as opposed to needing to put in that much extra manpower um, or effort to get new investors in there. Again, doesn't necessarily matter so much the type of project, but real estate related is really what we focus on a lot here at Advanta. So what type of accounts can be used for these investments? It is not strictly just going to be Roth IRAs. I don't know where kind of people got the impression that Roth IRAs really were the, uh, the only type of account that can be used for this. There are certainly many different other types of plans that can be used. Now, Roth IRAs are pretty awesome, and I think people, for the most part, should look into having probably some funds within a Roth IRA because who doesn't like not paying taxes on, on their investment returns? But again, having something where you front load your taxes and have already paid taxes going in is not always the best fit for everyone. Sometimes people need tax deductions, and that's certainly, certainly viable. Now, understanding that just because someone doesn't have a Roth IRA doesn't preclude them from investing in your project or using their money in your project. All of the different types of plans up here can be used if someone has one. So if you talk to someone and say, hey, I have a project coming up, do you have you know some retirement plans? And they say, oh yeah, you know I have this uh, traditional IRA or I have a SEP IRA or a simple IRA. That doesn't mean that they can't use them. They can absolutely use those types of plans. It's a the only real difference is going to simply be just what their taxation looks like in retirement, and we'll cover that in one moment. So the primary differences here are just going to be the taxation when you draw money out of the plan. So a traditional IRA can invest in someone's project, whether that as, as the lender on a project, as the subscriber to some shares, as the member of an LLC, as the interested party in a trust, just the same way that a Roth IRA can. The only difference being is that when someone is in retirement and they'd elect to take money out of that plan, they're just going to pay taxes proportionate to how much they took out as opposed to a Roth IRA where there's no taxes. Now, the beauty of all these types of plans is that any income that is paid back to the plan during the life cycle of the project. So let's say, for example, that you had borrowed money from someone's IRA and you're making principal and interest payments back to that IRA. 
they're not paying any taxes on those principal and interest payments coming back into their IRA plan. And it doesn't matter if it's a Roth, traditional, SEP, solo 401k, even a health savings account. All these different types of plans for the type of income that is received during its uh, investment life cycle are treated exactly the same, which is tax exempt, which is really nice. All of these things are extremely simple from that aspect as well, because you don't have to worry about flowing any of the income back to your personal income tax statement as well. So again, doesn't matter what type of plan they have. The tax reporting is very simple. The um, the consideration for the income, again, is all going to be the same. The only difference is in retirement. That's when they have to focus on what type of taxes they're going to pay. So whether you have someone that has an old retirement plan from something like, let's say, a um, old 401k from a previous employer, a governmental 457 plan, they work <laughs> they were in the armed forces and have a TSP. All of those types of plans can be rolled directly into a traditional IRA and used for investing. Um, so just because they don't necessarily have a self-directed IRA presently doesn't necessarily mean they can't establish one for getting involved in your project, which again is another really important aspect to understand. And maybe they don't have an IRA. Maybe they have money plugged away into a solo 401k or they're self-employed and have a SEP IRA. I've even seen some people do real estate projects within their health savings accounts, which is kind of a really interesting one to look at as well. So what I really want to hammer home on this slide is simply the amount of variety of the types of accounts that can be used uh, when you're approaching your investors as to being able to invest in your projects. Just because someone doesn't have the type of account that you know you think you might want to use doesn't necessarily mean that they're automatic, they're precluded from being able to do it. There's a lot of different options out there. And if you're confused at all on this, I recommend you reach out to Advanta, reach out to us. We can certainly help kind of go through this in more detail of really kind of hammering down you know, what these accounts look like, how people can move money over into something to utilize in a project that you have going on, what it would look like from the investment standpoint of how these are actually processed and what the taxation on these types of plans is as well. And but again, between, moving money between these types of plans is very simple. And the other big benefit is there's no taxes or penalties between moving from, let's say, an old 401k to an IRA or transferring from excuse me, a more traditional brokerage to an IRA. A lot of people think that, oh, you know, I have to pay a penalty on this. And this kind of comes from uh, when someone might ask a, a brokerage house, hey, I'd like to invest in my friend's real estate project, or I'd like to lend someone money out of this IRA. You know, maybe by no immediate fault of their own, they just don't understand the rules and how wide the options are for IRA investors to invest in, you know, different types of assets. They might be told or be under the assumption that, you know, if you do this, you have to take the money out of the IRA, you have to pay taxes and penalties on it. It's certainly not the case. Everything stays directly within the auspice of the self-directed IRA. You don't have to worry about paying taxes and penalties on the movement between these types of an account. It's all done, you know, intra Intra bank, if you will, we send a request to move the funds over from the IRA. The 401k plan would write a check directly to the IRA. So the client never actually touches the money. There's no taxes or penalties. Everything stays with under, <coughs> under the nice tax shelters of these IRAs. You don't have to worry about uh, paying things like taxes and penalties. Now, it's also important to understand some of the rules regarding these. Now, the middle section here is really what I want to kind of uh, focus a little bit on, and then the two portions on the outside we'll briefly touch on. So prohibited investments, you're not allowed to buy a life insurance policy within an IRA. If you're looking to raise capital from uh, your investors, that probably doesn't apply to you. Also, you know, most people aren't out here trying to buy large, um, you know, lots of uh, of artwork and uh, rare bottles of wine and alcohol and things like that with their uh, with their investor money. So I uh, just understand that IRAs cannot uh, own or hold uh, things like that. You can hold precious metals with an IRA, um, but that's kind of a, a topic for another 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 presentation. Now, prohibited transactions. A lot of people when they invest kind of go with the people that they know the best. And who do we know the best? But our family. Now. Some people have the opinion of investing with family or not with family. I personally like to keep my uh, Thanksgiving dinners as uh, mild as possible, so I uh, keep my investing circle outside of my family. Um, but for those of you that are out there that maybe do want to invest with family members, and from the context of this, <coughs> a prohibited individual with regard to your family is anyone directly up and down from you in your family tree. So your mother, father, son, daughter, and spouse are going to be disqualified individuals from you directly getting money from their IRAs to fund a project. Now, that's not to say that you can't partner with these people. So you could certainly partner side by side. So let's say 
that a um, husband and wife or let's say two spouses want to invest their IRAs together, they can use their IRAs together on a new deal. Um, but let's say, uh, for example, that uh, your child has a, a real estate deal that they want to get funded. You couldn't use your IRA to lend them money to acquire that deal. Uh, conversely, you also couldn't lend money to your parents uh, <clears throat> or a business entity that you own or control, that you have an owning controlling stake in as well. So you need to understand that there are certain people that you cannot directly deal with, uh, but you do have the ability to maybe partner with these people. But that's a really important one is that if you do invest a lot with your family members, that utilizing their IRAs uh, can typically be very problematic and for the most part is not going to be something that's a viable investment strategy for you. Now, the U UBIT and UDFI tax is something to do if you want to borrow money within your IRA. So you would like to finance the uh, the purchase of something within your IRA. So you're an investor that wants to use other people's money um, in your IRA uh, and borrow money, then you're going to be subjected to some taxes on that. <laughs> now, a better way to do that is do things as a partnership, um, set maybe set up like an LLC or a trust where everyone pools their funds together and you do it as a, uh, a cash deal. Uh, that will help to avoid things where you would actually be getting into uh, additional taxation by actually borrowing money within an IRA. Now, IRAs can lend money to people all day long. So long as that the IRA is not taking on the debt, but issuing the debt, there's absolutely no issue with UBIT or UDFI taxes with that. And I do hear that people get a little bit confused on that from time to time. But understand, so long as that the IRA is in a lending position and not a borrowing position, then you're not going to have to worry about um, UBIT and UDFI taxes. Uh, now we've got through most of this. If anyone has any questions, do please make sure that you type those into the chat box. I'm happy to address these throughout the presentation. So uh, please do make sure that you type those in if you have any questions. All right, some investment structures. And we have people that do all sorts of different things when it comes to actually acquiring money from other people. Uh, a big one that we see a lot of is multifamily syndication. So if you're someone that is trying to put together a syndication to... Uh, buy an apartment building. I'm working on um, one with an investor right here in sunny St. Pete, Florida, that is using people's IRA funds, not obviously for the entirety of the funding of the project, uh, but a big benefit is that he saw the value in in the fact that his investors had additional capital in their IRAs that could be used for this and put that to work. So not just having to use money from them personally, but also raising money and having the IRAs subscribe as limited partners into a multifamily syndication. Uh, again, that's a great way to kind of get more money out of the people that are already interested in your project. If you're trying to syndicate a deal, a fantastic way to raise additional money. Uh, private hedge funds, um, if you are someone that, again, same kind of deal with the multifamily syndication are trying to get more money out of people that are already invested with you, allowing IRAs to come in, fantastic way to generate more capital. Now, from the aspect of being a real estate investor, which again, a lot of people, and I would assume a lot of people on this call are probably uh, more into the um, single family, uh, let's just call it non-commercial real estate uh, realm, you can do all sorts of different types of borrowing structures for IRAs. So if you have a project and you just want to borrow some money, maybe give a first mortgage or even do an unsecured loan, you can certainly utilize IRA monies for that. And a great thing about that is that everything you pay back to that investor is completely tax free at the time of receipt for them. They only have to worry about taxes on the back end. Um, if you want to do a rehab project or anything like that, you can definitely use IRA funds for that. If you're having, if you're, ooh, I can't talk today. Uh, if you have a private startup company and you're looking to raise capital, again, because there's so much money in retirement plans, being able to access that for the initial startup capital for, for a startup company, a great way to go about it, especially with IRAs and with how lucrative startup startup investing can be. Granted, it is very risky, but the reward is very commensurate with the risk. If you have something that is going to pay back a 4X, 5X, you know, or however many times multiple on the investor's initial cash, that can be a huge tax liability for someone down the road. If they're utilizing an IRA, <laughs> they have absolutely zero issues, <clears throat> excuse me, with taking in that large chunk of money and not having to worry about any any taxes because the other benefit to this is that none of that income flows into their personal income tax statement. So another benefit of this is that if they're investing in a project with you, they don't complicate their 
personal taxable situation because everything that goes into an IRA does not flow through to your personal income tax statement. So whether you're doing a multifamily syndication or you're borrowing money or bringing someone in as a partner on an LLC or a trust for a rehab for a, for a real estate or a rehab project, you don't have to worry about having the person saying, oh, well, you know, this is all great and wonderful that I'm using my IRA, but how complicated is it going to make my personal taxes? It makes the absolutely 0% difference on their personal taxes um, with regard to complexity or additional income that they'd have to show, which in my opinion, if you can make something lucrative for someone and not complicate their taxes, that is a win-win almost in any scenario. So again, simplicity and additional tax benefits kind of go hand in hand with this and are a really big selling point if you're trying to raise money from people and offer the benefit of using IRAs. And also things like business ventures, joint ventures, <clears throat> private stock offerings, all these different types of things uh, can be can utilize IRA funds uh, to invest in these types of um, in, into these types of um, projects. Now, types of investors. You're going to have different types of investors when it comes into things. So you're going to have the more active and the more passive. Most of the time, people that you want to use their IRAs are going to want to be invested passively, just for with regard to how some of the rules work. Uh, being able to offer someone an IRA. Uh, investment that is more passive typically is going to be the more attractive option. Now, what are really the differences between these two types of investors? Well, active investors are going to be things like people investing directly into a rental project, directly into a rehab, doing wholesaling. Now, granted, maybe you are doing that and you want to use their money to do it. You can make it a passive investment by how you structure things. If you have an IRA and you want to go directly buy a rental project, yeah, it's going to be a lot more work on your end and going to be a lot more active, but the tax benefits inherently going to be the same. So if you want to do something and you want to be the active investor, finding IRA funds to finance those is going to allow the IRA to be in a more passive position while the underlying investment is more active. Now, some of the pros of being the more active investor is that you have greater control. You get to be the decision maker. You get to be a little bit more hands-on with things. Now, we certainly have plenty of IRA investors that really like that type of thing. Granted, it takes more time, but sometimes the benefits can be um, can be a little bit greater. You have some cons of the time, energy, and expense that it takes to actually be on the more active side. And let's face it, when it comes to people's retirement plans, most people want to be, um, you know, kind of the more quote unquote mailbox money position. They don't necessarily want to be so super involved in something that it takes up a bunch of their time because people have lives. They would like to um, you know, have these, you know, 10, 15, 20 year plans for their retirement that don't take a daily interaction in order to be successful. Now, not to say that some people don't really enjoy that. We have plenty of people that do that. But on the passive side, if you can make something a more passive position for the IRA, I've seen people be very successful in raising a lot of money from IRAs by having these types of structures in place. Now, what are some typical types of passive investments? Things like private placements and syndications, private lending. Lending really kind of being the big uh, benefit to a lot of real estate investors is that you borrow money from an IRA and pay it back. So that way they just get to sit back and collect their, <clears throat> their payments. And depending on how you've structured that, there could be equity involved in that. There could be uh, interest rate involved. There could be a lot of things that are involved in that. Now, the pros of being a passive investor, again, the investor, the, the IRA holder in this case, has very little time commitment. Past doing a little bit of research and due diligence on the front end, they're not involved in the day-to-day -day of the actual management of the property. They're not going to be bothered by the minutia. They, their IRA kind of gets to sit back and collect in the money that is going to be generated from the investment, which, again, I think is a really big selling point if you're going to try to be getting money from IRAs is to kind of play it up as being a more passive uh, investment for people. Now, some of the cons, you don't have as much control over the investment and you don't necessarily have as much say in the management of the investment by being a passive investor. But so long as that, you know, you are doing things on a, um, you know, up and up level, you are, you know, offering whatever you're doing uh, in a very, uh, ethical and you know straightforward way. Most of the time that doesn't come into play. But again, that's going to be something for you to work out with the actual investor, <coughs> excuse me, with the actual investor that you're uh, you're taking in funds from. Let's see. It looks like we have a question. Okay, got some good questions here. Uh, so you, can you use funds on multiple projects? Absolutely. So let's say you have um, 
let's say uh, let's say you have an LLC that you're putting together and you want to bring in an IRA uh, to fund and, and buy some mem LLC membership interest. That LLC could have multiple projects going on at once. You could have um, you know multiple LLCs for multiple projects and have IRAs be invested in, in multiples of them. You could have the IRA be invested in a note that let's say has several underlying secured interest of property on it. Or it could even be an unsecured note to you that you're using those funds for multiple different projects. It really is going to kind of boil down to be between you and the actual investor as to what works out the best. And that's the beauty of this is that there's really kind of no prescribed amount of different places that the money can be uh, utilized in. That's between you and the IRA holder as to what is a kind of comfortable medium of how many different projects, how much money is being invested, what are the terms. That all gets to be determined by you and the actual IRA holder. So multiple projects, absolutely. Let's see, another question. Can you be the organizer of the project, use your IRA and combine non-IRA funds of your own and others to fund the project? That really kind of gets to be a very fine-lined answer, and it's not as easy for me to kind of say yes or no. Um, there's the potential for it to be yes, but I would say that um, in that scenario where you are commingling personal and IRA funds into a particular project, um, you're going to have to be extremely careful with how that is structured and the ability for you to run into potentially prohibitive actions and run afoul of IRS rules is going to be infinitely greater than if you just didn't use your own personal IRA funds in that particular um, investment. So could you do that? Yes. Um, would I recommend maybe trying to structure it without your IRA being involved? Um, again, not for necessarily for me to say, but you would definitely probably you would definitely run into potentially less issues if you didn't have your IRA involved in a project where your personal funds are involved as well. But there is some availability for that to be workable. Um, <laughs> uh, let's see. I thought retirement funds could only be used in an S corp structure and not an LLC. Great question. Actually, that is kind of the antithesis of how that actually works. Um, uh, IRAs cannot be the cannot be a shareholder in an S corp, and that's not necessarily IRA or IRA, IRA rules. That's more subchapter S rules. Uh, the only people that can own a sub S are either a living breathing individual or a qualifying sub S trust. So an IRA can all day long, twice on Sunday, be the member of an LLC. Uh, it can also be the grantor beneficiary of a trust. It can be uh, held in a limited partner position in a syndication. It can own private stock, whether that's class A, B, or whatever it happens to be. It can be a debenture note or a convertible note investor as well. Um, there's a ton of different ways for, let's call it the quote, private security or the private equity side of things to be structured. Um, but one thing an IRA cannot be is the shareholder in an S corp um, again, and that's that's to do with S corp rules, not necessarily IRA rules per se. Um, but yeah, the uh, the IRA can definitely be structured um, into an LLC. But great question, I get that one a lot on people um, wanting to use S corps. Um, and again, you know the uh, the pass through nature. You can you can tax an LLC as a pass through, um, and then you know passing through the taxation to the tax exempt IRA essentially kind of gets you to the same place that an S corp does, but um, just at a you know quote more uh, more allowable manner, if you will. Again, great questions. Keep them coming. Um, you know, kind of rounding the corner to getting into the case studies. So please. Uh, <clears throat> Um, uh, one more question before we get started. As clarification, there are no fees when leveraging retirement funds. Well, I mean, we charge fees for our services, but not necessarily. There's no taxes for utilizing um, retirement funds in a particular project. So if you were to, let's say, have an IRA invested into an LLC, you're not going to have to pay like a VIG to the IRS for the type of investment structure that you're invested in. Um, just like you know, if you bought Apple stock or Microsoft or it, like. Tesla or something, you don't have to pay a fee per se for being invested in stocks, bonds, mutual funds, just like you don't have to pay a fee for being invested in the private side of things. Um, but, you know, the the administrator or custodian, um, you know, everyone has to make, <laughs> has to keep the lights on somehow. Um, but again, our fees are very minimal. And if you want to kind of dig into what we charge, again, happy to do that, um, you know, on a kind of one-on-one -on -one basis so we can, you know, show exactly what that might look like for you specifically. All right, moving on. Okay, now when it comes to investing with other people's money, a lot of times people are looking to borrow money from other people. Uh, again, you could do this where you have people coming in with their IRAs as members of an LLC or a trust or something like that, 
but a lot of people when they look to using you know other people's money typically look at it as as a borrowing uh, scenario and the really cool thing about this is that as as many hours as there are in the day uh, there are many ways to slice up how you would like to borrow money from people and what security can look like on those notes as well so it doesn't have to be a secured note at all it doesn't even have to be something as traditional as a 30 year mortgage you can slice these things up again a bunch of different ways a lot of people like traditional mortgage lending where you know you come to it and investors say, hey, I have a project going on. Would you like to lend money to me for it? Well, most of the time they would, you know, and this is holds true with big banks is the reason they do it is that they agree to lend you the money, but they want a secured interest in the property. You know, in the case that you don't pay them, then the IRA gets to foreclose the property. And instead of getting money back, they get a piece of real estate. So you can do that as a 15 year note, 30 year note, five, one adjustable. You can do it with a balloon and whatever works between you and the actual lender. In this case, the IRA and the IRA holder is going to work out you know, to the best of, you know, how the project flushes out, but you get to choose that. So between you and the actual investor get to choose how that is structured. It can be something that's short-term transactional funding. I've seen people do very well with things that are short-term. They just need a small bridge loan to in, be able to close a property, something that's maybe only a 60 day note. You can definitely do that. Granted, depending on how these things are structured can increase the amount of risk, which might increase the amount of, um, you know, consideration that needs to be given for the investment, um, you know, whether that's interest rate or equity at closing a lot of these things are going to be contingent on that but the beauty is that you get to work that out with the investor the ira holder it's not something that we're going to sit here and say hey you know you have to do it uh, by this prescribed method or hey you're going too far one way or the other between you and the actual investor which is the awesome thing when it comes to this is that we're very hands-off in how these things are structured so long as that you know kind of meets a a minimum fineness requirement of making sure iras are properly titled things are properly structured um, past that, it's, you know, the sky's the limit with how you do this. It can even be unsecured. Uh, there's no regulation or rule saying that you have to have security on a note to someone, but there is a higher degree of risk on the investor that, you know, in the case of that you don't pay them back, you know, the IRA is going to have to sue that person to try to recover. There's no immediate recourse to some type of security, like a piece of real estate that can just be foreclosed on. Another really cool part is that there can be equity participation and the security on a note does not have to be real estate related. I've seen people do uniform commercial code liens on farm equipment, automobiles, even livestock. Um, you know, it's, you know, something that I chuckle a little bit about here because, you know, there's not a lot of livestock in the Tampa Bay area. Um, but, you know, certainly in places that um, you know, do have large farms, you know, think the Midwest, Texas, places like that, people need money for those operations. And if you understand that and you want to have some type of loan to someone that you think could be profitable and there's, you want to have security on it, by all means, I've seen all sorts of interesting stuff happen. And uh, just because it's not real estate related does not mean that you can't bake it into some type of uh, security on a note if you want to use other people's money for that. So what I'd like to illustrate right here is that uh, just because that you might think a certain type of loan structure is what you have to use, that's certainly not the case. There's a lot of different ways to do this. And establishing note terms when it comes to borrowing money from someone you get to do that just completely on your own discretion and what's going to make the most sense between you and the borrower or sorry, you and the lender. So between you and the IRA holder, um, you know, it can be a thousand dollars lent out. It can be a million dollars lent out. It, I mean, and, and those are just arbitrary numbers. It could be more or less than any of that. Y'all get to choose the interest rate, the length of term of the loan. If there's going to be any type of type of equity participation, uh, the payment due date, delivery, all that kind of good stuff gets to be hashed out between you and the actual investor, you and the IRA holder. There, again, there's no prescribed method for this. You get to actually be extremely flexible and find something that works best for all parties involved and then loop in the IRA custodian at a point to where we will then ensure, make sure everything is properly documented, titled, funded <coughs> for all those great tax benefits to be, um, uh, to be maintained in place. All right. Now we're going to get into some case studies. We got about 15 minutes left. So again, any questions that y'all have, please do make sure that you type those in. Happy to address those. Uh, but let's look at how this kind of stuff works functionally uh, with some case studies. Okay, Bill and Stephanie's deal. 
Bill bought a house to flip and needs a private investor for some, some of the cash to uh, rehab the house. Um, Bill's known Stephanie, again, they're not related, um, as they grew up and attended uh, school together, and he explains to Stephanie how she can use her 401ks to invest in real estate. Again, this is kind of the conversation that I like to, to drill home to people, is that use the people that you know, um, that you trust, use your network to help increase your net worth. As corny as that sounds, I mean, it does kind of play true here is that you get to use these people that you know and understand. You don't have to go to a big bank to do something, especially if you want to be creative with this stuff. Um, you know, use the people that you know and trust to help, uh, you know, kind of increase your position and their position as well. So Stephanie does her due diligence on the property uh, that he's looking to flip and runs her own numbers on the deal and decides that 50,000 bucks is going to be kind of the, the number that's going to be workable uh, for Bill's project. So she decides to roll over 50K from her old 401k plan and agrees to loan Bill the money for the rehab. They work out the loan term, interest rate, profit splits, possible collateral, uh, and then they work with an attorney to have the, um, the documents drafted. Now, the key to kind of remember in this is that although you you know with a more traditional mortgage of a, like a traditional closing you're going to have someone like a real estate attorney or title agent handling this but all of the investment documents need to be in the name of the IRA so in this case it's going to be Advanta IRA for benefit of Stephanie Smith IRA number XYZ are going to be how any and all documents so it's not your it's not their personal name going on it as the lender it's the IRA being named as the lender and that's mortgage deed of trust note property policy of title insurance, all of that kind of stuff has to be directly in the name of the IRA. Now, anyone can draft these documents, doesn't have to be an attorney, but Advanta cannot provide examples of these or draft these documents for people. Okay. Sorry, just a little bit of delay on how this is moving forward. Okay, so what does this look like from a number standpoint? So the loan amount is gonna be $50,000. $50, the interest rate is 5%. Now, they baked in equity participation to this note, which is something I think is really cool, essentially saying that 25% of the profits of this deal are also going to be paid back to the lender. Now, this note has a one-year balloon, and then the monthly payment is $270, um, and there's a first mortgage on the property. So in this case, they decided that the consideration is not only going to be interest, but also there's going to be a, a recorded security on the property. So just like... Bank of America holds the note or SunTrust holds the note on a piece of property that you live in. In this case, uh, <clears throat> her IRA is going to actually be, Stephanie's IRA is going to be what's listed on the public record as the lien holder on the property. And it's Bill's responsibility to pay it back or if there's a violation of the terms of the note, then Stephanie's IRA could foreclose and take back the property as repayment. So those are the loan terms, 50 grand, 5% interest, 25% of the profits paid back, one year balloon with a two $170 monthly payment. Now, <clears throat> with regards to the note and the documents, Bill's note, Bill's attorney prepares the note and the mortgage. Everything is read and approved by the IRA client, and then Advanta holds the note directly. Six months later, the project is complete. So Bill finds a buyer for the property and is ready to sell the property for 200 grand and gets $40,000 in profit after closing costs. Stephanie provides the payoff amount to uh, the title company and everything is paid back to the IRA completely tax deferred. So what does this look like with regard to what the numbers come back in? So the repaid principal was $50,000. She got $1,600 in payments back to the IRA. Again, no tax paid on that. She got $10,000, which was 25% of the profit. So her total earnings in six months on that 50 grand was $11,600. Now, Bill's earnings, uh, he got $40,000 profits on the sale. He had to pay $1,600 in uh, payments on the loan. The, <clears throat> the loan payoff was an additional $10,000. And then the net profits he received, all said and done, was $28,400. So... Stephanie's IRA got back in $11,600 in profit plus her underlying basis, completely tax exempt. And then Bill made $28,400 in six months of profits on the deal as well. So you can see both of these people made money on the deal. They didn't have to go to a large traditional bank. They got to deal with the people that they knew and trusted, and he didn't have to use his own money in this to actually fund the deal. He got to use someone's IRA. And again, this kind of being the rising tide raising all ships was a great benefit to both of them. And in this case, there was equity participation and a recorded mortgage on the property. So that's one way to do it. Now, you can certainly lend someone um, 
money and not have any security on it, this is going to be a significantly riskier operation. So if you need to borrow money um, and it's not something where it ne th they would maybe necessarily be able to offer some type of recorded security, you can definitely do that from someone's IRA. But keep in mind that you know this is going to be a riskier endeavor for the investor uh, and you might be paying higher interest rates commensurately. So in this case, Tom has $50,000 in a SEP IRA. He has a friend that wants to expand his business and needs some short-term capital. And this is where we see a lot of unsecured notes kind of op coming in as people trying to do business expansion or things like that. So he wants to expand his business and needs short-term capital. Tom decides to lend the money from his SEP IRA and is willing to lend the money without any collateral. Drafts the unsecured promissory note listing the IRA as the lender. And here's the terms. There's $50,000 at 10% interest on a one-year balloon note with a lump sum payment of $55,000 at the end of the term. So in this case, it is a <clears throat> one-year balloon with a total $55,000 payoff uh, coming back into the IRA. Again, no taxes paid on this, but it is going to be a significantly riskier endeavor because in this event that Tom's friend cannot repay him, then the IRA would be the one that has to sue the other individual to collect. So if you need to borrow money in an unsecured fashion, you know, keep in mind that uh, you know, there are some additional considerations and that that is a riskier endeavor for the uh, investor uh, on that side. Now, also keep in mind, if you are going to be doing unsecured lending or lending of any type, you also always need to make sure that you are not going to be in violation of what are called usury laws. Usury laws are, are uh, state by state and they determine how much interest in total can be uh, collected on a particular note. So you always need to check with the particular state, check with an attorney to make sure you're not violating, violating usury. Now, this is not something that we check at Advanta. So, you know, all states are different. Some states might cap it at like 20%, 15 percent um some states don't have a cap on usually it can be 100 percent interest on something but you always need to check with that particular state because those are laws that you can run afoul of with an ira if you're charging too much interest or if the compounding consideration for the note and some do consider equity participation to be a form of interest on a note uh, would get you into a position where you would violate uh, usury laws so important to understand that there are some additional regulations out there especially when it comes to borrowing money from people that you can run afoul of um, and again, because there's no title company involved, we have to have the original note in our possession. Uh, secure, unsecured lending is going to be riskier than conventional mortgage rates, so uh, you're going to have to pay a little bit more money uh, for that type of money. And uh, you know, the the IRA uh, owner needs to make sure that they know and trust you because it could be very difficult to recover uh, if you've borrowed money from someone and there is no security on that note. Now, if you want to use other people's money for things like investing in LLCs and trusts, you can definitely do that as well. And we see this a lot with people uh, investing in real estate. A lot of times people will put together LLCs or trusts in order to buy real estate. And maybe instead of wanting to borrow money, uh, you'd like to bring in people as equity positions into these particular deals. You can definitely do that with an IRA. So you can bring it in. You can bring people in as IRAs, offer them LLC membership, offer them beneficial interest in trusts. <laughs> Again, there's not necessarily one prescribed method of doing things. So, you know, take this for kind of a very high level view of this, um, you know, for, for, for how this might work. So in this case, Larry has a rollover IRA from a previous job and he's looking to invest part of the 250 grand uh, in, in, a business, in a business venture that he has with uh, his acquaintance, Mike. Um, they're forming a new private insurance company. So the insurance company is looking to issue stock and raise capital to get the company off the ground. So this is kind of more of the um, the startup company angle. But you can kind of transplant this into, <coughs> uh, let's say, uh, Mike wanting to put together an LLC to buy an apartment complex or Mike just putting together an LLC to buy a single family home. Same kind of principle applies in so far as how the investment is actually structured. Um, you know, the ultimate intent of taking in this money uh, can be many different things. I've seen this kind of thing work with everything from breweries to farmland. So, you know, again, just be a little bit open-minded on what the ultimate um, kind of intention of the LLC uh, is in this case. Uh, so who does what? Uh, Larry needs to open the account. We request that a transfer from his other IRA of $100,000 come in. We review the investment prospectus of the new company. Um, and then uh, he decides to invest $100,000 at a dollar per share. <clears throat> you would need to review and approve all of the offering documents. So if this is more formalized, it would be something like a private placement memorandum, a set of subscription agreements, all that kind of stuff. 
uh, we would open the account for him. We'd ensure that the proper titling on any subscription documents is done. Uh, we'd sign the subdocs in the name of the IRA and eventually wire the funds to the um, actual closing for the purchase of the uh, the shares. Now, the investment strategy for this, again, this is kind of one of more of those longer term plays. So having the ability to access funds from people's accounts that they aren't looking to use for a long time can be very beneficial in these types of scenarios. <laughs> so Larry holds the private stock within the IRA indefinitely. You know, there really isn't kind of an end goal for this. You know, you're kind of hoping for either a payout acquisition or for the company to expand to the point where, you know, maybe they even go public. Uh, Mike and his team uh, position the company over a few years to have the company go public, and that's what's working out in this scenario. The company goes public for three years later, and the shares begin trading at $2 a share. So remember, initially purchased for $1 a share, now they're trading at two. Double your money, not too bad. Uh, Larry works as the account manager to move the private shares to a brokerage account where he can sell them on the open market, and then eventually sells the shares for $2.25, returning $225,000 to his IRA completely tax-free. Now, again, you can kind of work with this scenario of saying, hey, you know, I bought LLC membership interest, maybe not private stock, and the LLC was investing into a rental property. The rental property portfolio sold, um, and they doubled their money on the real estate, so the payback to the LLC members, again, would be double the initial share price. So, you know, the basic structure can kind of supplant to many different w ways of thinking about this, but, you know, in general, this is how, you know, you could utilize other people's money for raising capital for a startup. So again, how can we help? Again, if you're looking to raise capital, we have a lot of different ways that we can try to help people, especially if you are, you know, maybe in the more private stock arena uh, <clears throat> or you're maybe putting together a syndication or something. We can do things like private landing pages, you know, help with marketing flyers. We also do co-webinars with people, um, online events such as our Pitch, Promote, and Prosper where people can actually come and pitch deals uh, to people that are clients and are clients, um, kind of some examples of what we've done with people uh, that are maybe looking to raise capital for different um, different investments that they have going on and the like. And again, if you ever want to try to raise capital from people, actually find other people's money, we have a great event that we're very proud of. It's called Pitch, Promote, and Prosper. We do it every other Friday. So not this Friday, but next Friday, we'll have one <coughs> Excuse me, going on. Uh, and it allows people to uh, kind of get up, pitch what they have going on, look for other people uh, that are looking to either invest or do similar things. And again, this is a mixture of our clients, Don clients. It's always free to it free to it free to join and attend. I'd really recommend if you enjoy our educational series and you want some more networking with people uh, to try to uh, make sure that you attend that. So that's pretty much it. We're hitting right up on one o'clock. So I want to respect everyone's time and get y'all out of here at a reasonable point. If there are any questions, I'll stick around for a few moments. So please do feel free to ask them. I want to thank everyone for being in attendance today. Really enjoy being able to present this kind of information. I hope you found it useful and interesting. That said, have a great day. And again, I'll stick around for a few moments to see if there's any questions. Thank you. Let's see. Um, do you assist with personnel who are looking to invest in opportunities based on those pitches? Um, I'm not exactly sure the context of that. I'd say maybe give me a call. Um, to see <clears throat> what exactly you're looking at, um, because the answer could be yes or no, but um, it's probably a little bit easier for me to have a call. So maybe give me a call later on today or shoot me an email and uh, I can help you out with that question. Uh, how do you open an IRA account? The easiest way is to uh, shoot me an email and I can certainly get you the paperwork for it and how much money can you put in? Well, you can transfer an unlimited amount from other IRA custodians or old 401ks, but if you just if you don't have any other type of a retirement plan, you're going to be limited to six or seven thousand dollars per year um, that you can just take out of your own personal pay and drop into an IRA. But if you have um, other IRAs or old 401ks or retirement plans, um, then there's no inherent limit. You can transfer as much money you want to between different uh, retirement plans. Uh, yeah, the slides get emailed out afterwards. So if you signed up for it, you will get a copy. Um, let's see. So uh, I have an IRA. What kind of support do you have for IRA just to make sure things are done properly? Um, well, that's that's an interesting question. So we don't do any due diligence um, or review of of the validity of an investment for a particular investor. Um, our job is to make sure that uh, you know when an investor brings us documentation that it's properly titled for an IRA. Um, but that's not to say that we're we're you know just kind of leaving people to the wolves. I always encourage people if you have questions like that 
to talk to an attorney or a CPA or an advisor that can look into that um, from a legal perspective. It's not that we don't necessarily don't want to, it's just legally we're not licensed to do that. Um, so if you wanna make sure things are being done properly from that perspective, always recommend you talk to someone that is licensed to do that, um, such as an attorney. So you can always go back to them if things don't go well or don't go as expected, then you have recourse and an actual, um, someone that can actually represent you um, uh, for that type of, um, for that type of action. Uh, with regard to our fees, it's really gonna depend kind of on what you're doing. Um, I encourage you to shoot me an email, we can set up a consultation and I can go through exactly what our fees would look like um, to that, but our fees are very minimal. We don't charge commissions or base our fees um, on the amount invested. So, um, you know, give me a call, I can certainly help you out with that. Um, <clears throat> Uh, if you are self-employed, yes, there are plans uh, for that that you can invest, uh, you can put in um, up to roughly $60,000. That would be something like a SEP IRA or a solo 401k. So if you are self-employed, the contribution limits are significantly higher. Um, but that's something, again, a little bit better for us to kind of review on a phone call. So shoot me an email. We can set up a consultation to that effect. Um, it just kind of depends, again, a little bit on what your personal situation is, and that's a little bit more of a detailed conversation. So happy to help you out with that. I've helped hundreds of people with that. Just uh, shoot me an email. Email's right up there on the uh, slide right here. So shoot me an email. We can set up a consultation to review that in more detail. All right, with that said, I'm gonna let everyone go. If you have any further questions, reach out to me directly, shoot me an email, set up a consultation is the best way to do it. A Perny, that's A-P-E-R-N-Y at advantaira.com. Thanks and have a great day.